Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to start talking about some of the home automation things that we're planning to do on the build. Um, and in this opening section, a bit of a history of some of the home automation technologies that I've played with over probably the last 20 years or so. Um, so I'm probably going to do this as a, a series of uh, videos around the technology, maybe looking back at some of the history in a little bit more detail. Um, I started my career training in electronics so what, and, and obviously later moved into IT. So, you know, like a lot of technologists, we like to play with different technology at home. And I've had various home automation technologies probably over the uh, last 20 years or so, I would say. So I started playing uh, initially with a technology called X10. So X10 was a power line uh, technology. So you plug devices um, into the mains and they sent a signal over that mains wiring on top of on top of the mains voltage if you like um, to control light dimmers relay switches those sorts of things um, and I played with that on its own uh, initially I said probably 20 years ago maybe a tiny bit longer than that um, and the first step I took into um, more complete home automation was with a platform from a company in Singapore called Comfort um, or SciTech, had a platform called Comfort um, and they produced a an automation system that was based around a hardwired home alarm um, so it looked like an ordinary alarm box connected to PIR sensors around the house also actually interestingly to a, an intercom that I had at the front door um, and this was designed for you to interact with it through voice. So you could use a phone in the house, you could dial home and, and interrogate it, not through AI understanding your voice like you'd have today, um, but it would speak out commands and you could, you could press things in. Um, and that had the ability to integrate with other technologies like X10. So I was able to take the uh, X10 devices that I had like sockets that could be controlled, dimmers, I, I think I even had some modules that went in light switches and things like that. Um, and that worked really quite well. Um, I loved the intercom, you know, you think of Ring Doorbell today, it was actually a much more reliable version of Ring Doorbell, an intercom at the front door, if you rang that, it rang the doorbell in the house, if the alarm was set it phoned my mobile phone and I could talk to whoever was at the door and I might be in South Africa, Russia, wherever it was, it was great. Right? Um, so, um, and much more reliable than, than than Ring. I could answer it when I was driving my car. You know, you can't do that with an app on your phone like you need to do with Ring. So, actually, some stuff about it was really good. Um, and that was hardwired into the house. Um, what I found with that over time was that the X10 part of it became unreliable. And an X10 was uh, one of the challenges with that. You could send a signal, so it basically broadcast. You know, a device like a socket or a dimmer would have an address like A5, um, and you would send a signal that said "turn on," and you didn't know if it got there. You didn't know if it turned on. You didn't know if somebody unplugged it. Um, so it wasn't great in that sense. But also, it started to become less reliable, and I. Th I think that was due to more electronics coming to the home and things like switch mode power supplies in lots of devices generating noise on the home wiring which meant that X10 signals didn't get through and you didn't know that they got through. So I moved on from X10 and started working with another technology which was a wireless based solution called Z-Wave. Um, and there were, you know, Z-Wave is a communication protocol. I think that's a proprietary chip that people have to buy into, which is unfortunately what keeps the price a little bit higher than some technologies like Zigbee. Um, but lots of different companies made modules. Um, they generally interacted with each other. The first gateway that I had was a, a Vera, or a, a device. Um, and I had dimmers uh, behind light switches and things like that. Um, I later moved on to uh, Fabaro. And Fabaro makes some great hardware. The software I found not so great at times uh, on reliability and functionality. And they did a lot of modules themselves. Um, just put a picture up here at the moment of what was in my kitchen at the previous house. So these were modules about the size of a matchbox that you could put behind a light switch. Um, there's a lot of wires there. It's actually a bit simpler than it looks. But you know the problem was I, I usually had to dig out the wall to put a deeper wall box in to be able to fit these sorts of switches 
Um, but the one that you can see there had four momentary switches along the front. And that allowed me to control um, a, a local dimmer channel, two relay channels, and also to control LED coloured lighting strips that were actually driven by similar little modules elsewhere in the kitchen for under counter uh, LED strips and things like that. So Z-Wave was, was quite good. Um, and we were lucky enough to be selected by E.ON, uh, the energy provider, to be a trial home for a number of technologies which just happened to be Z-Wave based. Um, so they work with a company called Greenwave that were initially developing hardware and they had um, sockets, they had uh, light bulbs which I think actually were Zigbee, um, thermostats, radiator valves um, and they took the advantage of one of the things, the couple of great things with Zigbee in comparison with X10 is you could see status. So if someone controlled a device locally, like a light switch or a socket, you could see that. But it also monitored the energy consumption, and that's what E.ON were interested in. So we were able to see the consumption of all of the appliances in the home, room by room. Um, and that really helped one of the things that, that you know, I, that was a, a group where we weren't just given the hardware, but we did a lot of uh, workshops with other uh, people in the trial to help understand you know different demographic uh, people and how they adopted technology and what they thought of it and I found that quite interesting you know some people were looking and saying oh, I don't want to use my kettle or my toaster because it uses three kilowatts or but it's only on for two minutes and, and what I found really interesting through that process was the ability to understand the phantom load right and that that really is the important thing of trying to reduce the baseline consumption of the home to as low as possible um, you know, something that's drawing 50 watts 24 hours a day, 365 days a year is something you need to worry about much more than your kettle. Uh, and that helped me see, and I had an example of that, I had a TiVo hard disk recorder that at that time was costing me £70 a year. That would be more like £300 at today's energy prices. Um, so and we, we, we weren't really using it to watch anything, so I just turned it off. So, you know, that, that was really interesting from Z-Wave. I did a lot more with uh, Fabaro ended up controlling everything in the house so every light switch had a module behind it um, it was connected to all the PIR sensors of the alarm it was integrated with Sonos it was integrated with Alexa so you could ask Alexa to turn lights on and these sorts of things and the reason I preferred that over some of the other technologies like um, Philips Hue is a good example and, and we had similar bulbs from I think it was TCP that went bust that were part of the EON trial um, and I, I didn't like that concept of a controllable light bulb because if somebody turns off the light switch you can't control it anymore um, which meant you had to use the app to interact with it you know and, and, and I know there are ways around that with things like Hue that you can get battery powered light switches that go over the, the old one um, but I found that a little a little frustrating um, Whereas the, the route that I then took with Fabaro modules behind the light switch, you can interact with it manually. It doesn't change the state. You can still change it through the application or through scenes or alarm triggers or whatever. So that, that, was, that was quite good. Um, the problem I found with Fabaro, um, I think the hardware was very good. Um, the home control hardware was generally reliable. The last one I had, Home Center 3, was pretty good. But the software was not great the integration with other platforms was not great um, so when we sold the last house the people that bought it from us I offered to, to remove everything from the house and make it dumb but they uh, they asked me to leave the technology in and I think I believe they've added to it since so on the bungalow that we're at here um, I've you know I've got a clean slate to start with we're going to be rewiring the house completely um, so I don't need necessarily to do these retrofit solutions and can actually wire the property up uh, in such a way that I can get the best from the automation. So the platform that we've looked to use that is from uh, Loxon. Um, and Loxon is, is, whilst you can retrofit and they do modules a little bit like the Z-Wave ones I've described that you can fit behind light switches, uh, what we're doing is hardwiring all of that so there'll be a much larger consumer unit which will have DIN rail mounted dimmer modules, relays, interfaces into things like my garage door, the heating system, um, but all central and hopefully reliable. Because one of the things that um, I found with home automation, you know, it's, it's got to work. You know, we jokingly said the, the, the wife acceptance factor is the important thing that 
this technology shouldn't get in the way of the way the family interacts with the house. It should, to all intents and purposes, be invisible. Um, and you shouldn't have to try and find your phone to interact with it or try and remember the exact phrase to get lo uh, the Alexa to turn on the lights or kick off a scene or play the music that you want. Um, and the concept of locks on is a little bit different in that it's um, mostly presence based. So every single room in the house will have a presence sensor which will sense the, the, the light, ambient light level in the room when someone moves in the room, but also listens to audio so that you shouldn't ideally, oh, let's look at this, come back, come back to this later. Um, you move into a room, it triggers the scene and it can tell if you're still moving around in that room. So it won't sort of turn the lights on for five minutes and they go off, right? So the concept with the locks on system is I will have predefined scenes. You know, you walk into the kitchen in the morning, it will open the blinds, put my favorite radio station on, set the lighting the way that I want it. And then you only need to interact with the light switches to change the scene to a different scene. Um, and I, I looked at a house down here recently and they had a bank of about 16 switches on the wall for all the different spotlights in the room, you know, and it was so many different computations of what you could do with the lighting. Well, you don't really want that. You probably want four different scenes. I'm cooking, I'm eating, I'm watching the telly, I'm listening to music. Um, so it should be much simpler in that way. Um, Locks on describes their platform as a clopen, um, and what they mean by that is it's a closed system, so a little bit like the ecosystem of an Apple technology. You know, my Apple Watch works with my Apple phone, works with my uh, Apple tablet. Um, uh, but but with Locks on, the clopen is closed like that, as a closed ecosystem, but also open, and you can add modules to it. So I can add a module to talk to my. Um, Hormon garage door, or I can add a module to talk to KNX devices, I can add a module to talk through Modbus to my air source heat pump. Um, so it, you know, it, it is able to connect to those other things. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, why you're not looking at open system platforms like Home Assistant, there's various different, you know, Linux based things that you can run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, actually, some of those do fit alongside Loxon, and I might do some of that. But what I didn't want is that a software update written by an open source community came down and broke the house. So the foundations of the way that the basic things in the house work, I want in that lockdown system. If I can enhance it by bringing things in like that with open source for some fun hobby projects, that's great. But I don't want to get up on a Monday morning and find that a software update has broken everything. Um, you know, the, the challenge to that is I'm paying a professional installer to do some of the work. So I'm looking to do the first fix. I'll be pulling all the cables and those sorts of things, but I'm paying someone to do the initial setup and programming, probably more to do that programming than I've spent on home automation in total in the past, right? So it's quite a commitment, but some of that is also cost I would have had in the setup and build of the house anyway. Um, what I'm hoping is that, you know, from an IT background, I know a bit about software and programming, probably more about the hardware as well. I bought some locks on gear a year ago, so I've been playing with it, programming it. Um, they don't offer a lot of documentation, which is a frustration. Um, but there's a lot of tutorials and videos and things online, and there's a lot of support communities. But what I'm hoping is that, you know, once I pay the partner to do that initial configuration, I'll be able to tweak it and add and change a few devices as I see fit. Um, I think that would be a concern if you weren't technically biased that if you needed to change anything you're going to be paying a lot of money to bring someone back in. If it isn't the original installer they've got to kind of understand what was put in in the first place. I'm not sure how, quite how well it's all going to be documented. So that's all going to be a bit of a challenge and I'll do a series of uh, sessions on looking back at some of the other technologies that I've used in the past and a, a bit of fun actually now on, on this video um, we did a lot of stuff with um, Fabaro for Halloween uh, I mentioned that that was connected to my lighting into Sonos into Alexa all these sorts of things so using PIR sensors dotted around the garden and Sonos speakers and the lighting control uh, we set up something that when kids were trick-or-treating at Halloween would trigger various events and lighting and sounds around the house. Had a lot of fun with that. Um, it was that scary that some of the small children cried, so I came up with this um, 
a schematic of what I was going to do the next year at trying to look at either using AI to judge the age of the uh, of the person or using uh, motion sensors at different heights to work out the age of the child and adjust the scariness level. Um, so take a quick look at the uh, at the video that we did you know quite a few years ago now, but a lot of fun. So as you can see, you know, some of this stuff is a hobby, some of it's a bit of fun. We're building this into the house. I'll go through um, a lot more detail on some of the stuff in the future that, you know, and I'm sure we're gonna have some integration challenges. Um, I mean, I'm having to do an interface, for example, for my shades and um, Velux windows connecting through a Somphy to Homer gateway. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that one turns out. Just thanks again to all of you that have watched my video so far. As I record this, I'm at 98 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. I want to go over that 100 subscriber limit. And it's been really interesting to see the comments from people. Um, and in particular, the things that people are interested in. So one of the videos I did early on was around Part L building regulations. And does it make sense to spend more money on insulation? Um, and that's been my my busiest video so far uh, with over 800 hits which you know small in YouTube standards but you know interesting to me to see what people uh, want to see so yeah, please click like for this video if you haven't please subscribe I hope you enjoy it um, I'll be coming back with a series of videos around home automation as we go forward on the build um, there's a great deal happening here uh, the rest of the roof should be going on next week um, we've signed a contract for the air source heat pump. Uh, we're getting things arranged for the underfloor heating. Um, so whilst I've been doing little things around the site and the builder's been doing the heavy work of foundations and building walls, um, all of the bits of technology that I'm looking to do are all coming at me thick and fast um, over the next few months. So that'll be installing mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, um, first fix of the wiring for the property and the locks on automation system uh, fitting of the bathrooms uh, and kitchen so you know lots and lots to do over the next few months uh, so you know please look forward to coming you coming back and seeing what we're up to um, and thank you again for all the feedback if you've got any comments if you can see things that i'm doing wrong and you've learned lessons tell me before i make the same mistake as you thank you very much